Well, thank you, Doug and Susie, and uh, thanks for all that are attending and the CCFA for putting this together. Um, so to answer the question, Doug, I know we're running a little bit behind. Um, I don't know. So thank you very much. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a few more minutes. So um, Doug had mentioned this, and I think that um, Kim, Bob, and Gil coming before me has really helped shape this discussion. And I'll give you our experience in Pittsburgh in terms of the patient-centered medical home. And I heard from actually all three of the speakers the words patient-centered had come up. So what is a patient-centered medical home and what is the history? And this has really traditionally been a primary care model in the last decade that has come out of the healthcare reform law. This has been, uh, different societies have endorsed it. This combines primary care with systematic improvement of a patient population, includes personal physicians who provide contact, chronic registries, technology, and communication. Well, what about subspecialty medical homes? I think all three speakers have mentioned that as subspecialists, this is really a novel concept to us in terms of quality and patient-centered care. And I went back to 2010 where some of the first articles were being published on patient-centered homes for subspecialists. And these uh, endorsements or the statement that was made is certain specialist practice provide long-term principal care for chronic conditions and should be eligible to serve as medical homes. Well, I would say that all of us who take care of IBD probably fit into this category. Cardiology, chest, neurology has already done this. And the question though is, do we as subspecialists, are we ready to provide primary care or principal care. Well, this is a uh, table that's probably hard to read, but in essence what it shows is that cardiology, even endocrinology and pulmonary provides very little primary care for our patients at this point. <clears throat> so the last two years, and I'll tell you the story of where we are in Pittsburgh, and this is going to launch, our patient-centered medical home is planned to launch in January. So hopefully if I come back in a year, I can present where we are at that point. The purpose of the IBD medical home is to provide high quality, comprehensive, cost effective, patient centered health care for those with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So it's interesting, two years ago when I sat down with the insurance company, and Bob actually already alluded to this, uh, um, the first thing that was put before me was cost. And the first discussion was, how are you going to cut costs for this group of patients? And these are the top 10 costs, and it's amazing to see the health economic data that can be presented by insurance companies around costs. Now, a lot of this had to do with biologic therapy, surgery, but there was an underpinning of mental health as well. Gil adequately already said, do we know our denominator? So we put together executive summaries each year for our IBD Center in Pittsburgh, and this is what our health plan, our insurance company, was interested in seeing. So this is fiscal year 11 to 13. You can see last year we had about 6,300 patients we saw. Of those, about 1,800 were new Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients. Interestingly, though, only about 20% of these patients were insured by our own healthcare insurance company at UPMC. So 80% were not, and we'll come back to that in a minute. I'm not gonna read through all of this, but the other thing that the insurance companies were very interested in is quality metrics, and I give Gil a lot of credit. He's come a long way with us in terms of understanding these quality metrics, and these are now implemented into our EMR. The other thing that they're interested in, and just to look out for, are the CCAP scores. All of you get them, you may not know it, but insurance companies are looking at this as ways to grade us as physicians and do what we call physician profiling, which sounds negative and I know it has that connotation. But these are our six IBD physicians. UPMC insurance plan has this. They presented these data to us. Department of Medicine's the green line, uh, GI is the yellow line, and so they know what the data are in terms of communication and satisfaction of our patients. Well, what's a medical home look like and how would that look for IBD? So this is something that we've been working on as a group for some time. And again, at the center of this are our patient uh, nurse coordinators, who essentially are what I term as our air traffic control. 
We have IBD schedulers. We've done away with central scheduling. We have IBD schedulers now that schedule our patients. We have IBD-specific surgeons. We have a visceral inflammation and pain group, which I'll mention in a minute. We have an IBD Connect program, which are patient volunteers, and I couldn't agree with Gil more. We need our peers, our patient peers, to be involved in these plans, and we'll sub, uh, have an abstract we're going to present at this end of the session. Quality prevention, electronic porters, and the like. And this is really built on top of a traditional IBD center, which many in the room may be familiar with in your own practices and groups as well. So the second phase of meetings with our health insurance plan really happened over the last one year. And so they sat down and said, great, we want to do an IBD home. They're also looking at this for rheumatoid arthritis, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and about six other diseases. IBD is actually going to be the first in Pittsburgh. The others are going to come after this. And they actually have narrowed down on a granular level and looked at mental health surgery and biologics and something called the high utilizer patient. So to start, who are these high utilizer patients? Well, Dave Binion in our group actually put together a hot spot or analysis. If you're not familiar with this, this is taking administrative databases and looking at spots of patients who are getting admitted to the hospital. So in the top left is uh, the state of Pennsylvania. You can see the dark red, so eastern Pennsylvania, and then us in Pittsburgh and western Pennsylvania, which I've outlined in the blue on that one map. But look at the bottom left. So these are all the hospitals in our area that admit Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients. And probably not surprising, as a tertiary referral center, we're seeing most of those patients. So that's not a surprise. Top right, probably you could have predicted this as well. Out of the nearly $37 million spent on inpatients in one year, roughly $24 million came from our institution. But what's really surprising, look at the bottom right, and you all have these patients, you see them in your practices every day. 34 34 patients accounted for $10 million in charges. That's what a high utilizer or super utilizer is. Then we looked at this and said, you know, we don't need fancy genetic tests or blood tests to tell who these people are. Ask your nurses. Ask the people that handle these calls. So we published a study, again, Dave Binion taking the lead on this, and we looked at a two-year phone call registry. So in 2009, our IBD nurses took over 21,000 calls. In 2010, they took over 32,000 calls. But we looked at our data more closely, and you're going to see trends. So if you like math and you like trends, you're going to see trends. 15% of our patients accounted for half of all of these calls. We also linked that these calls, these high call volume patients, were the ones that were more likely to go to the ER and the hospital. Again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Patients who call your office frequency are also the ones who are going to the ER and to the hospital. So another way we've identified this super utilizer. Then our own insurance company came to us and they said, Dr. Ruggiero, these are the patients that are spending you money. So on the left are the percent of member months, on the right are percentage of expenditures, and again, you see a, a common number. 15% of our patients account for nearly 50% of our health care expenditures. So one of the interesting things, though, and this was published in JAMA, and if you haven't seen this, this was in February of this year in 2014, and the concluding statement was this, the new, the next critical phase for patient-centered medical home development should focus on the deployment of high utilizer patients with chronic conditions, IBD would fall into that, frequently with concomitant mental illness, pain, and often poor social support. So we're very fortunate in Pittsburgh to have Eva Sigethy, who's a psychiatrist who's really dedicated her career to the care of IBD. But what we're realizing now is that about half of our patients have some behavioral, mental, or stress component that's leading to their disease process. And you see this as well. And, and again, you don't need to be a basic scientist to understand the mechanism of the stress behind these patients. So we've now employed psychiatrists and psychologists, and we're in the process of setting up social workers. We're using shared decision making, and she's doing some shared decision making with these patients to look at how we can improve their coping individualized care and better quality of life. 
So I'm just going to give a concrete example of what this means on a real basis. And probably all of you, if you start to read this patient, will cringe initially because you've seen these patients in your offices and going to the ER quite a bit. So this is a 45-year-old. Her, her real name's not Anne. Is a 45-year-old woman with a 12-year history of IBD. She's had a couple of surgeries, but guess what? She has no active Crohn's disease. We've effectively treated her active Crohn's, but she's depressed, she has pain, and she has had a difficult time working. Our patient volunteers from IBD Connected visited her, and she said, I hate the pain in the emergency room. People are awful. They treat me like a drug addict. So this drug-seeking behavior, and yes, she's on narcotics. What happened last year? She's had 23 hospitalizations, 19 CAT scans, and seven endoscopic procedures. So our insurance plan is looking at the millions of dollars this patient is spending and say, you have to fix this. You have to change this. So Dr. Sigethy and her group puts us through these behavioral health sessions, these face-to-face, -face, and some of them are web-based sessions. They use guided imagery, and her favorite image now is when she has pain, she imagines holding a balloon, and if she feels the pain, she releases the pain into the balloon, and it evaporates into the air. I know that sounds a little corny. At first, I thought the same, but guess what happened last year? She hasn't been back to the hospital. Even her group are looking at inpatient detoxification. Gil mentioned narcotics is an important parameter for this as well. So this is a patient that has had a real impact. We've shown, and her group has shown, that we've decreased ER and hospital days, PCP and IBD visits. We're also working with our surgeons, and I think the three that came before me talked about multidisciplinary care. So when now we meet with our surgeons twice weekly to talk about which patients need surgery, and most importantly, at the bottom, we've set up clinical pathways for surgery that has really targeted those who need uh, surgery. We're also looking at drug cost, and this is a big 800-pound gorilla in the room. So when I was coming out here, the director of our pharmacy insurance plan said, you know, Dr. Regera, we have six biologics now approved for IBD. There are probably two or three more on the horizon, and we cannot afford to continue to pay at the rate we're paying for these biologics. We somehow need to be smarter. I'm not suggesting that biosimilars are the answer, but if you haven't heard of them, this is coming, and this is coming from an interest on a cost and a payment from the insurance company side. They presented these data uh, to us. So for us, we're familiar with two drugs, adalibumab Humira and infliximab Remicade. And these are drug costs in 2011 in billions of dollars on the right side. So you could argue that these are a bit higher. So this is something that we're also looking at our care pathways to say, let's not get rid of biologics. We know they save surgery. We know they save hospitalizations. But let's be smart in who we use them. We're also embracing our pharmaceutical colleagues who are actually coming in within this medical home concept. For the first time, we had a meeting with pharmaceutical agency, the insurance agency, and us as physicians in the same room. Telemedicine, I'm not going to spend much time on. Uh, Ray Cross has really pioneered this with Vanderbilt and UPMC. I think telemedicine's the future. Andrew Watson is a colorectal surgeon, so it's interesting. We have a colorectal surgeon who's the director for Center for Connected Medicine. So all the bells and whistles and cool toys, what we're using is how can we keep the patient at home, in school? Why do they have to drive in to see us? We can do many more things remotely than we've done uh, before. Some of you in the room are involved in this. This is an Eastern Time Zone uh, conference that we've set up with several sites throughout the country where we talk about IBD and difficult IBD cases, and I've already talked to some of you at this conference. I, I really appreciate the CCFA, and um, so both Bob Barakoff and Rick McDermott have been wonderful that now we're publishing this IBD Live series uh, in our, our IBD journal. And then so finally, I'm going to end with a couple of slides on where we are now with the insurance company. And maybe, maybe in your regions, as you start to set up some of these pathways, I would implore you to sit down at some point with the insurance company. I always looked at them as the enemy, as the devil. And actually, interestingly, there's more common ground between us than I had once thought. So what they've done through this medical home project is they have identified the counties by which they have patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. No way you can read this, but they've come up with a specific Crohn's and colitis tool. 
They've looked at uh, line of business. They've looked at the amount of money patients spend. They've looked at the counties that these patients are coming from, and they look at the percentage of care that these patients have required. And we can now toggle through these and take the 5,000 patients, which they originally wanted us to see, and said there's no way we can, as an eight-person IBD group, take on the entire medical home for every one of these patients. But we now narrowed it down to 722 high utilizer patients. So we can look at the spend per member per month, PMPM PM if you hear that, per member per month spend of patients who specifically spend on their IBD care. So we've narrowed it down, age range 16 to 50. These are the patients we're gonna look at first. They cost $8 million to the health plan last year. And these are the patients we're gonna start targeting as part of the first iteration of the medical home. Aetna and United have started to knock a little bit on our door to wonder, is this something that they can develop as a subspecialty plan in the future? So I think there's real value in the, the medical home, and I'm just gonna end with one slide um, on how is an IBD center different than a home, and then I'm done and I'm happy to answer questions. So I think we're all used to an IBD center. Well, many of us live in it now. IBD center is a collaboration with the hospital and the medical center. The center is often built around the healthcare team. Gastroenterologists, all of us, serve as consultants and we're referred patients by other doctors or providers. We're in an RVU-based world, volume proposition for payment. We get institutional support for downstream revenue. So IBD itself doesn't usually make a lot of money for us. I don't mean to put that crudely, but the surgeries, pathology, radiology, and fusions make the hospital a lot of money. What's an IBD patient-centered medical home gonna look like? Well, the collaboration's gonna be primarily with the insurance company. We're gonna put the patient, and I, I forget who said this, I think maybe Gil, we're gonna put the patient at the center of this care model. Gastroenterologists will serve as the principal care providers, and the referral or population-based care will be controlled by the insurance, the payer. Value-based metrics rather than value-based, and the support is actually coming from the insurance company. So they've actually given us money to hire a social worker, a psychologist, a dietitian, and a nurse practitioner to take better care of these patients and ultimately reduce their cost. So thank you very much. I think the question still remains. Will this be the future? But I appreciate any questions and discussion. Thank you. Why don't we let him present his abstract?